in the middle of the oceans of our world, the fires of creation burn. As this new lava and the rocks beneath it cool, they thicken to some 60 miles, forming the outer shell of the globe, called the lithosphere. Numerous shallow earthquakes are recorded along these mid-ocean ridges, still deeper ones at the edges of some continents. These earthquakes reveal that the lithosphere is fractured like a giant eggshell into some 20 huge slabs or plates. Here, the African plate, the Indian-Australia plate, the Pacific plate. This lava lake is analogous to how these plates float on a partially molten layer beneath the lithosphere. As they jostle for position, the plates spread apart at mid-ocean ridges, grind past each other or slide beneath each other. Those carrying continents collide. This ceaseless movement rearranges our world and makes it the living machine. When we view the seemingly immutable mountains and canyons that surround us, it is hard to believe that the planet we live on is in constant flux. Yet Earth's surface is broken into many huge sections that move and shift. For those who live on plate edges, the results can be devastating. This extraordinary film of an earthquake in Japan was captured in May 1983. But the tectonic drama begins in the five mile deep ocean trenches that ring the Western Pacific. Here the westward moving Pacific plate sinks beneath Asia, beginning a complex and violent journey back into the hot interior process called subduction. As a result, Japan is one of the most earthquake-riddled places in the world, coping with alien forces that invade at will. Tokyo alone has been devastated nearly once a century for the past 2,000 years. Japan has been called the land of living volcanoes. Its history, a chronicle of tragedy. Yet its people seem to know that their land owes its existence to volcanoes. With stoic resolve, their life goes on, as the Japanese have learned to live with this endless cycle of plate tectonic destruction and rebirth. Along the southern edge of the Asian mainland are India and the Tibetan Plateau, punctuated by the Himalaya Mountains. Here, 29,000 feet above sea level, fossils of ancient marine life are preserved in the rocks. They tell the remarkable story of another plate boundary where continents collide. More than 40 million years ago, the northward movement of the plate carrying India crashed into Asia and the Himalayas were born. So intense is the collision that even as far north as China, thousands of miles inland, the Asian continent is being pushed aside, creating powerful unseen forces that can strike without warning. A dramatic example of this came on the morning of July 28, 1976, in the Chinese city of Tangshan. Ravaged by a colossal earthquake, 20 square miles of the city collapsed in total ruin. As many as three quarters of a million people died in a tragic and dramatic display of plate tectonics. Another kind of plate edge is marked by the San Andreas Fault on the coast of California. Here, the Pacific Plate moves violently past the North American Plate. April 18th, 1906. In a single minute, 
the Pacific Plate lurched 20 feet northward along the fault, releasing energy that had been building for a century. The earthquake and resulting fires destroyed much of San Francisco. Today, California's San Andreas is among the most studied faults in the world. A specially equipped NASA jet allows us to see some of its most striking features from the air. Along central California's Carrizo Plain, the fault clearly marks the edge between the Pacific Plate on the left and the North American Plate on the right. Here, as perhaps nowhere else, a boundary between two plates is dramatically visible. The scar of a great tectonic contest, as the strength of rock of one plate is pitted against the strength of another. The fault extends from beneath the sea. It begins where Baja California has been split from Mexico, runs up on land and splinters California in two for a thousand miles. Despite popular misconception, California will not sink into the Pacific. Instead, it will slide ever northward. In 15 million years, Los Angeles will be a suburb of San Francisco. The Giants and the Dodgers could again be crosstown rivals. But what concerns scientists most are places where the two plates are sticking, building ominous stress. Each day, the tension builds and the cities along the fault continue to watch and to wait, asking not whether, but when and where. At the California Institute of Technology, computers model the Earth's interior to better understand the forces that keep the plates in constant motion. On the leading edge of research into this complex frontier of geophysics are Brad Hager and Robert Clayton. The worldwide seismic network records the thousands of earthquakes that rock the Earth each year. Like X-rays, they are a tool for looking inside the Earth. From these waves, scientists infer the density and even temperature of the deep rock. By using this data, Clayton has produced some of the first three-dimensional maps of the Earth's interior. These 100-kilometer slices show the dramatic variation between hotter regions in red and colder regions in blue in the subterranean layers called the mantle. These maps reveal an interior far more complex than we ever imagined. In another demonstration of computer modeling, Brad Hager simulates convection through a cross-section of the Earth's mantle. In this model, the solid rock of the Earth's interior, driven by radioactive heating, flows like a liquid over geologic time. Each cycle, taking a few seconds on the computer, actually takes a half billion years inside the Earth. A new frontier opens. Science is just beginning to understand the powerful forces that constantly reconstruct the Earth's surface. Kilauea Volcano on the island of Hawaii. A powerful testament to the paradox of creation and destruction. Much of Hawaii's legend grows from this striking spectacle. The fire goddess Pele lives here, beneath the molten flood. But for scientists, the volcano is a window on the interior. Like the Grand Canyon, it is a revealing geological laboratory. Located in the middle of the Pacific Plate, Kilauea is mysteriously thousands of miles from a plate edge where most eruptions occur.
Hawaii is the youngest of a 2,500-mile chain of volcanic islands and undersea mountains that stretches west to Midway Island, then north along the submerged Emperor Seamounts. Geology reveals that the islands grow older the farther they are from Hawaii. What causes this unique chain of volcanoes to form in the middle of the Pacific Plate? In a remote area of the Big Island, scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey's Hawaii Volcano Observatory begin an unusual task. The lava of Kilauea holds a fascinating tale. Let's see. To unlock the story, geologists Ed Wolf and Tina Neal must capture the molten rock uh, while it is still hot. Right here. You got the glove? Rashid, can you come with the water in the can? They are armed for dangerous work. In another age, they might have been knights riding forth against demons or dragons. 100, 300, 400, 450, 7. Sure, sometimes I'm scared out there. Uh, sometimes my heart beats a little fast. I'd be worried if it didn't. When I first arrived, I went through the evolution of being just frantic at walking on lava that I knew was two hours old, to being able to do that quite routinely. But we do take precautions and we are sensible out there. Can you go back and get the asbestos glove, the white glove? Right behind you. Time is crucial. As the 2,000 degree lava begins to cool, its chemistry begins to change. Telltale gases are lost, erasing secrets of its origin and composition. Water cools the lava, turns it to glass, and freezes its message in time. This is as close to the Earth's deep magma as scientists can get. Unlike volcanoes on plate boundaries, Kilauea's lava contains untouched primordial elements from a source two billion years old. Scientists suspect that Kilauea rides atop a stationary thermal plume they call a hot spot, with roots perhaps as deep as 2,000 miles into the Earth's interior. As the plate moves over this rising plume of molten rock, one volcano after another is built. Hawaii itself is moving off the spot. 19 miles south, a new volcano has risen 8,000 feet above the sea floor still some 3,000 feet below sea level. Dubbed Loihi, it will be the next Hawaiian island in a long chain, striking evidence of the relentless drift of the Pacific Plate. The Mississippi River, site of the largest earthquake in American history, some 20 times more powerful than San Francisco's devastating 1906 quake. In the winter of 1811-1812, three massive quakes changed the river's course and altered the landscape for hundreds of miles. The earthquakes were centered near the Mississippi Valley town of New Madrid, Missouri, once envisioned as the gateway to the west. Today, New Madrid is a peaceful Midwestern community. But in 1812, it disappeared. James Craven, mayor of New Madrid. Good spot to see where the old town was because the old town is right uh, in the middle of the middle of the river. Uh, sometime after 1812, after the earthquakes. Uh, the channel of the river moved over and cut away into the town, so really the old town is right out there where you're looking. As a matter of fact, if you could just imagine another, say, five miles straight through there is Real Foot Lake, and really is the only uh, evidence 
of the earthquake. So, you know, there's not like any big cracks in the ground or uh, anything to show people. And people do ask that question, you know, uh, they want to see some evidence of the earthquake, but, uh, you know, there's just nothing you can tell them except, uh, you know, hang around. Maybe you'll get in the middle of one of them. At the Abasco Corporation, uh, John, an engineering uh, firm in New York City, Dr. Otto Nutley of St. Louis University and geologist Fred Snyder are exploring the mystery of the new Madrid earthquake by computer. What we see here down the center of the map is... What caused this massive disaster hundreds of miles from a plate edge where most earthquakes occur? And here's the city of New Madrid up at the Kentucky bend of the Mississippi River. John, let's turn on the three biggest earthquakes that occurred in the area. We've taken over 2,000 earthquakes that were recorded in this area from 1974 through 1983 and put them into the computer. Each cross represents a single earthquake. Computer plotting of recent earthquakes provides unique clues to the past. 170 years after the massive quakes, the New Madrid zone is still alive. One thing we can do is look at these earthquakes in three dimensions now to try to get a better idea of how deep they are. The distribution of earthquakes outlines fault planes, longer and deeper than previously thought. Because great force is required to break and shear rock at such depths, it is these deep faults that concern the scientists. And this is important because it helps us to understand how the fault is being reactivated. 600 million years ago, the North American interior was neither flat nor quiet. The continent was tearing apart along a great rift. Then it stopped. Time has healed the great gash. Today, increasing east-west compression on the fault zone may reopen the ancient wound. And for the first time, this gives us a physical model of the cause of the New Madrid earthquakes, and it might ultimately lead to our ability to predict the earthquakes. In the 1811-1812 earthquakes, few lives were lost. Today, some seven states and 12 million people will be affected. Cities like St. Louis and Memphis are beginning to consider New Madrid's destructive past as they plan for the future. Elsewhere, another new frontier of continental tectonics confronts science. The famed Golden Gate Bridge links the Marin headlands to the city of San Francisco. For tourists, it is a landmark, but for scientists, it is a footbridge to a foreign land. Bonnie Murchie, David Howell, and Davy Jones of the U.S. Geological Survey are pioneers of a revolutionary new theory about the assembly of continents called microplate tectonics. By studying marine fossils locked in the rocks of the Marin Headlands, they have discovered that the all-American city of San Francisco came from someplace else. You know, I used to have a paleontology professor who used to say you should never lick rocks because you could get some kind of terrible disease. I think we've all got it. <laughs> Primitive one-celled organisms called radiolaria thrive in the sea. Like myriad invisible plankton, their skeletons drift to the ocean bottom when they die, forming part of the sedimentary rock. Similar to opal and quartz in chemical composition, radiolaria are remarkable for their symmetry and delicate beauty. They have been likened to living snowflakes. An acid bath technique etches away the solid rock. Carefully, the harder shells are released to tell their amazing story, free from the bondage of a hundred million years.
The abundance and variety of these shells is a product of ocean temperatures and environment. From analysis of these once living jewels, Bonnie Murchie can determine the age of a fragment of former ocean sediment, at what depth it was formed, and its probable geographical location in the distant past. The fossils from the Marin headlands suggest that the piece of land anchoring the Golden Gate Bridge was formed in the deep ocean several thousand miles to the south. Some scientists now believe that San Francisco was built from many bits and pieces they call exotic terrain, chunks of land that have migrated from somewhere else. The exciting aspect is that the 10 terrains that we've seen in the San Francisco Bay region, the character of these terrains can now be shown to describe the distribution of terrains throughout Western North America. We have discovered up to 200 terrains such that the continent has grown by at least 25%. Deep oceanic rocks in Idaho, exotic microcontinents in the Canadian Rockies, coral atolls now atop mountains in Alaska. But exactly where these exotic terrains came from and how they got where they are now will challenge science for decades. The vast power of the computer has allowed Christopher Scotese of the University of Texas to reconstruct whole chapters of Earth's intriguing past. My work is really a fulfillment of a childhood fantasy to invent a time machine and travel back in time. In effect, that's really what we're doing here, uh, using interactive graphics to, to take a peek back into time and see what the continents and oceans were doing millions of years ago. It's really like a second voyage of Columbus, but this time it's a voyage in time and not a voyage in space. Geological data about ancient latitudinal positions is processed to scientifically reconstruct the continents. Some 250 million years ago, the world was assembled in the giant landmass of Pangaea, much as Alfred Wegener envisioned it just 70 years ago. Africa and South America fit easily. North America overlaps, possibly because exotic terrains have since changed its shape. By rotating from the equator to the South Pole, it becomes clear why there is evidence of glaciers in the Sahara Desert. Africa was once located in a polar region, just as Antarctica is now. I think one of the most important things we're learning by going through this exercise is that plate tectonics is a global process and it affects a variety of other global processes, such as climatology, uh, mountain building, and possibly even evolution. This turtle is on a 1,200 mile journey. Each year, green turtles swim from their home along the coast of Brazil to a tiny nesting ground in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Their destination is a remote volcanic peak along the mid-Atlantic ridge. The barren rock of Ascension Island is the setting for one of the most remarkable dramas in evolution. Dr. Archie Carr, zoologist at the University of Florida, has been studying green turtle migration for 30 years. It's easy to see why uh turtles nest on islands, there are not many predators on islands compared to mainland shores. Down in Brazil, for instance, there used to be jaguars roaming up and down the shore. They would eat the adults nesting as well as the young and the eggs and everything else there practically. Every other carnivore does the same. But the big question is, why do they go all the way out to such a distant island in the middle of the ocean? How did it ever evolve? Now I've come to understand that it wasn't under present geographic conditions. Plate tectonics has now given us a beautiful explanation of how this thing could have slowly been acquired without killing them all off as they made that effort. As Africa and South America split, a succession of islands emerged, then disappeared as they moved away from the mid-Atlantic ridge. As the ocean grew wider, the distance to each new island grew longer. Gradually learned over millions of years, these hatchlings will swim much farther than their distant ancestors, and even farther than those who brought them here. 
If Archie Carr is right, plate tectonics may have shaped the genetic code of the green turtle. The drifting of continents may have programmed life itself. And so the search continues to learn how Earth's internal heat engine drives the plates on their long journeys across the face of the planet. To discover the Earth's vast and complex history as revealed in the rocks. To investigate our living machine and its endless cycles of creation and destruction and new tools and technology in space will allow us to see in new ways to continue the rediscovery of planet Earth. But the more we learn, the more we want to know. The words of T.S. Eliot amplify the scientific paradox. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you.